Hi, and welcome back to my videos for General Chemistry 1. Today we're going to finish our discussion of Lewis dot structures, and we'll look at some of the trickiest molecules to draw structures of. You might think that the hardest structures to draw would be large ones. For instance, isooctane, which is one of the compounds in gasoline, or the amino acid tryptophan. But the Lewis structures of those molecules are actually pretty easy to draw. Instead, some of the hardest structures are for very simple molecules. For instance, this molecule, dinitrogen monoxide. Way back in video 5, I told you that this compound is used as an anesthetic in dental procedures, and with only three atoms, it's certainly one of the simplest compounds you can imagine. Or is it? It turns out that dinitrogen monoxide isn't as simple as it seems. The trouble is, in this molecule, and in others like it, we don't know which atom is the central atom. Is it one of the nitrogens, or is it the oxygen? In the last video, I told you that the central atom is usually the first one in the formula. But back in video 5, you learned that the first element in the formula is whichever one is furthest to the left on the periodic table. For molecular compounds like this one, those two rules can be in conflict. So in order to know the Lewis dot structure, we need a way to figure out which atom is at the center of the molecule. Here's how we do that. We still follow the rules we learned in the last video for determining a Lewis structure. So, you might recall that in step 1, we count up the valence electrons. There are 5 for each nitrogen, and 6 for the oxygen, for a total of 16. Now in step 2, we sketch out the connections between the atoms. But this time, we don't know which atom is in the center of the molecule, so we'll draw both possibilities one with nitrogen in the middle, and one with oxygen. If you had three or four different possible central atoms, you'd draw a structure like this for each possibility. Next is step three, where we add dots to the outer atoms until they obey the octet rule. We'll do that for both of these structures. If you count the electrons we've used so far, you'll see that we have four electrons in the bonds, and 12 dots for a total of 16 electrons. That means we've used up all of our valence electrons. But unfortunately, the central atom still doesn't obey the octet rule in either molecule. So, you might remember that our last step will be to convert some of the dots on the outer atoms into bonds. This is actually the challenging part. In each molecule, there are two different atoms that can have electron pairs that we can convert into bonds. Which one should we choose? The answer is, we don't really know. What we need to do is to try both possibilities. So for the first molecule, we'll try making a bond to the nitrogen, and we'll also try making one to the oxygen. In the second molecule, we'll try making a bond to each of the two nitrogens. But now that we did that, we can see that the central atom still doesn't obey the octet rule in any of these molecules. So, we'll need to convert another electron pair into a bond. Once again, we have two choices for each molecule. We can form a bond using the atom on the left side or on the right side. We don't know which one to choose, so we'll try both. In the first molecule, that means we can form a bond on the left, which gives us a triple bond between the two nitrogens, or we can form our new bond on the right, which gives us two double bonds. In both cases, the central atom now obeys the octet rule, so at least we've accomplished that goal. Now we do the same process for all the other molecules, which eventually gives us eight different possible structures. Or does it? If you look carefully, you'll notice that some of these structures are actually the same. For example, these two structures are identical, so we can ignore one of them. The same is true for this pair of molecules, so we'll drop one of those. There's actually one more pair of molecules that are identical, although this one's less obvious. These two molecules are actually identical. They both contain a nitrogen triple bonded to the oxygen, which then has a single bond to the other nitrogen. 
The fact that the triple bond is on the left side in one molecule and on the right side in the other doesn't change the fact that the molecules are actually the same, since you could just pick one molecule up and rotate it around to see that it's exactly the same as the other one. So now we have five different molecules, all of which obey the octet rule. How do we decide which is the correct structure? To do that, we need to understand something called the formal charge. The formal charge is the charge an atom would have if the electrons in all the bonds were equally shared between the two atoms. So for example, suppose we had a molecule of carbon monoxide. Here's its Lewis dot structure. Suppose we want to know the formal charge on each atom. The carbon has two electrons in the electron pair. What about the bond? Well, each bond contains two electrons, so a triple bond contains six total. To calculate the formal charge, we pretend that half of those electrons belong to the carbon and the other half belong to the oxygen. So the carbon has a total of five electrons. To get the formal charge, we subtract that number from the number of valence electrons the carbon has. Carbon has four valence electrons, so the formal charge is 4 minus 5, which gives us negative 1. Now we'll do the same for the oxygen. Like the carbon, the oxygen has two electrons in the electron pair and three in the bond for a total of 5. Oxygen has six valence electrons, so the formal charge is 6 minus 5, or positive 1. So back to our example of dinitrogen monoxide. To decide which Lewis structure is the best one, we need to calculate the formal charge on each atom in the molecule. Let's try that for the first molecule. The first nitrogen has two electrons in the electron pair and three electrons in the bond. Nitrogen has five valence electrons, so the formal charge is five minus two minus three, which is zero. The middle nitrogen has no electron pairs, so the formal charge is 5 minus the 4 electrons in the bonds, which gives us positive 1. And finally, the oxygen has 6 valence electrons, so its formal charge is 6 minus 6 electrons in the electron pairs minus 1 electron in the bond, which gives us a formal charge of negative 1. We do that for each atom in all five molecules, which gives us these formal charges. So, now, how to choose between them? It turns out that structures are more likely the closer all the formal charges are to zero. None of the structures we drew have a formal charge of zero for all their atoms. If there was such a structure, that would be the best choice. But we can rule out these three structures, which have atoms with formal charges of two or minus two. So we're almost done but we still have two structures to choose from. Both of them have atoms with formal charges of 0, 1, and minus 1. How do we decide which is more likely? It turns out that the most likely structure is the one that has the most negative formal charge on the most electronegative atom. You might recall that the electronegativity is higher when we go up and to the right on the periodic table. So oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. That means the most likely structure is the one where the oxygen has the lowest formal charge, and that's this one. So that's it. Now that you know about formal charges, you can find the Lewis dot structures for even the most challenging molecules you're going to see in this course. You'll get plenty of practice during class, in the homework, and on quizzes and tests. It's a skill you'll even use if you take an organic chemistry course, so it's worth spending a little time practicing. And that's it for now. By now, you're really developing some skills that are very useful for chemists, and there's more to come in future videos, so I hope you'll join me again for the next one. Until then, have a good week!